As the coronavirus has continued to spread, fitness studios, therapy clinics, and even doctor's offices around the country have been shutting their doors and adjusting to a new reality. For the fitness and wellness industry, the sudden shift has inspired creativity and flexibility for gyms and studios, which have largely been dependent on physical locations and on-site staff. Well, adapt and pivot have been the mantra of those that are thriving in this environment. And if you mix that with a foresight and experience, then you have my two guests today. As gyms and fitness studios have closed their doors, my guests have found new ways to grow and reach even more people than they could with a bricks and mortar traditional fitness approach. My first guest is Peter Barber. He's a kinesiologist and founder of Sino, which is a virtual healthcare platform that connects providers and clients. He'll walk us through the shift in corporate wellness in the digital age and the benefit to individuals to utilize online health teams to improve their health. In the second half of our show, we'll talk to Jill Whalen from Whalen Wellness. She relaunched her business during the pandemic with her online bootcamp, where she coaches her clients on a balanced approach towards wellness from the comfort of their home. Well, Peter joined us from his home here in St. John's to talk more about this shift to online health. So let's listen in to what he had to share. Welcome to the show, Peter. Hey, how's it going, man? It's great. It's great. It's uh, it's a really timely time for you to come in for a chat. Everybody in Canada is talking about the second wave of COVID-19, and you happen to be in the virtual health and wellness space. Tell me a bit about your background and, and about your company. Yeah, so I, I'm a kinesiologist uh, working for the last 15 plus years uh, here locally. I've also worked uh, internationally uh, with, with health and fitness as well. And, uh, and you know, the, the focus that I've always had is, is about making uh, health and wellness more accessible to people. First, that manifests itself um, as I worked in my first company where we had a studio, we did rehabilitation, we did corporate wellness. And then we started seeing a trend, you know, the trend about two or three years ago, we noticed that specific corporate wellness, people were working remote. And, and all, all of a sudden, you know, workforces weren't just a couple set offices. It was about, okay, now we got people all over the world that meet um, online every morning for the daily standups. And, and so all of a sudden now our traditional approach as to what wellness was, uh, specifically within corporations, was changing fundamentally. Um, and so that's when we said, like, there has to be no solution. We have to have a way to make the accessibility of healthcare more, more paramount to the, these companies, these employees. And that's when we started working on Sinos saying, hey, what if we had a virtual platform? What if all these experts were here at people's fingertips and they could access it whenever they want to? Um, so that, that's kind of that, that very quick synapsis journey about where I was and where we are now. Mm-hmm. And so your, your, your company itself it does a, a, a platform, like I said, it's online and people can access all different types of healthcare professionals? Yeah, our main focus is within the realms of fitness, nutrition, and, and mental well-being. We also do have medical services as well, depending on the area of Canada that you're in, because those, those services are regulated. But, uh, but we kind of look at our platform really as what I call holistic mental health. A lot of people look at mental health as just therapy, and that's a very important part. Um, however, really, mental health is more than just therapy. It's, it's, it's people's physical health. It's people's nutritional health. It all comes together as to how people's mental, mental psyche is, is working and whether or not it's efficient. And, and in today's world, with, with COVID and, and everything that's happening, people's mental states are being challenged greatly every single day because the the limitations in our normal flow. So what we want to do is say, hey, listen, if we can give people access to this broad array of healthcare providers to be able to enhance their mental wellness, well, then we're doing something right. Right. I mean, so mental wellness is something that people uh, have a bit of a stigma around still. There shouldn't be because it's something that affects 80% of us throughout our lives. Is there any hesitancy for people to use an online platform or do you find the opposite? I, I would say the opposite. Um, we've actually had feedback from uh, employees that are using our platform, other people, and, and the statements that we're hearing is, I never would have tried this other than the fact that we've removed so many barriers. So, you know, if you think about a normal uh, session for therapy, um, number one, there's barriers of cost. So a lot of people don't realize this, but, but um, mental health therapy is typically between about $120, $180 per hour. Um, and with, with the insurance side of it, um, is not direct billed. 
So what, what I mean by that is you got to go in, you actually got to pay out of pocket for the service, get the receipt, and then get reimbursed. Um, as opposed to, say, physiotherapy, where you can go and get direct bill, where you only pay about 20% of the cost up front. Um, so there, there's a bit of a pain point there. And on top of that, finding out who they should see, um, actually having to physically travel there. When you live in a place like Newfoundland, uh, the anonymity is really taken away because the chance of you knowing the person sitting right next to you is probably pretty high. Um, so there's a lot of, of pain points there, but with virtual, where they can go on our platform, search through all our different providers, see the bio, bio of the person that they want to see, and then book and see their availability right away. There's there's no there's no challenges there, so they can just do it right away and try it out. Hmm. I think that's funny because people will literally follow their hairdresser or barber to a new location if they go because uh, that's so important that they have the right person to do that. But yet when it comes to our healthcare, we quite often don't shop around to find the right answer. And so that's that's kind of a nice feature to be able to pick who you can work with. What are some of the things that differentiate people that are in that field? So mental health is super interesting, and this is why a lot of people get confused. So you have uh, psychotherapists, you have people with master of social work, you have counselors, you have psychologists. Um, so there, there's a broad array of, of different types of, um, of certifications and education that people can have. So for, for the common person just looking through it, how do you sift through that piece? So what we do is we try to put people's backgrounds and education front and foremost to be able to give people a choice. Because I think right now when it comes to healthcare, and I think you'd agree with me, is that we pick our providers purely based by location. Like, is it close to where I work or where I live? Or do they even have availability to see me? Like, do I have to wait two or three weeks before I get in? So the way we work our platform is that we actually link with their schedules. Um, so whatever availability they have will just pop up on our platform. So we can typically get people in within about 48 hours instead of actually having people having to wait like two weeks. Right. Okay. So I know that you don't do as much uh, medical on your platform. It's more on the on the wellness side. Uh, but what uh, what are some of the challenges Canadians face when it comes to getting access to healthcare, especially a physician? So specifically from like a primary care perspective, um, you know, with, with, with family medicine. So this is where most people see the challenges. Um, number one is, is available time slots. So typically, you know, family, family doctors are only available from nine to five, which, which conflicts with a lot of people's lives, depending on the level of severity of what they're trying to do. If they need something after nine to five, they're going to the emergency room. Mm-hmm. Um, and the emergency room, you're looking at about, on average, about a five hour wait time. I'm sure that's actually decreased now since COVID because less people go in. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I don't know what the, what the most recent stat is on that, but with the really, really long wait times. Um, and so that, that's been a, a massive problem and, and just the inconvenience of then going and sit next to other sick people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like my, my aunt, for example, uh, needs to get uh, a regular prescription refilled um, on a regular basis. And she's not sick. She just needs to go in and get a script refilled every you know, two, three months. But she's going and sit down next to all these other sick people mm-hmm. just to get a script refilled. And that doesn't make any sense. That, that's a perfect example of someone that should not have to go in and expose themselves to that. According to Statistics Canada, about 4.5 million Canadian residents don't have a family doctor. And even those that do have a family doctor can't always get an appointment with their doctor when it's needed. According to the 2016 Canadian Institute for Health Information Survey, 20% of Canadians reported waiting 7 days or longer for an appointment to see their family doctor. Similarly, 61% of family doctors surveyed reported not being able to accommodate same-day or next-day appointments for urgent needs. And only 1 in 3, that's 34% of people, are able to obtain medical care in the evenings or on weekends. As a result, simple health care matters such as prescription renewals often wind up involving visits to crowded walk-in clinics, long waits in the emergency room, or even the decision to forego medication or medical care altogether. Well, actually, that takes a lot of time as well. So I think that's would that be one of the value propositions for companies to to have access to healthcare people so that people can I, I know just for example myself, my workouts. If I get up for a workout and I work out virtually with my friend, I get up five minutes before the workout, walk in the other room. I never miss the workout anymore. Yeah. But when I went to the gym, it took a ton of time. Um is there is there some value for the companies on that side when it comes to the time saving for people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the statistic is the average amount of time for a person to actually have a doctor's appointment. And typically, a doctor's appointment might last maybe 10 minutes if you're lucky, right? You get in, you ask your one question, they give you their opinion, and then you leave. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, depending on the doctor that you're seeing. Um, 
but the reality of, of the wait times uh, is typically hovering around that two hour mark. Mm -hmm. um, and then you got commute going there and going back. By the time you get back to your office, you're sitting down and sometimes you need to pick up your script, mm -hmm. right? So like you go to the doctor, you get your script, typically they go straight to the pharmacy. It might take a half hour for them to fill that then as well. So you're almost looking at about three, three and a half hours for that 10 minute appointment in the middle of the day. Right. Okay. So what about, um, we have a lot of rural populations here. We've got people uh, that are older that may not be as adept with technology on the overall wellness side of things. What type of technology do you need to access a platform like yours? So it depends on, on various types of technology that are out there right now. Like, you know, um, the, I think the first thing we should actually talk about is privacy and security. So like that, mm -hmm. that, that's a big piece when it comes to what platform do you, do you pick? Right. Um, you know, so like right now you have common things like you have Zoom, you have Skype, you have Google Hangouts and all these sort of things. And the important thing people realize is that some platforms are meant for social reasons and they do a really good job at that. Um, like we're using Zoom right now, right? Mm -hmm. I am perfect for this. And then others are for more, uh, let's say, sensitive information. It might be legal, it might be healthcare related, or these sort of things. And you need to make sure that that connection is fully encrypted so no one's going to be able to steal and hack in um, any personal health information or anything that's proprietary. So so it's it's not about one platform's good or one platform's bad. It's just about different platforms have different uh, needs and necessities of, of how you use it. For us, we have a browser-based platform. Some have apps that you got to download onto your computer, but for us, it's browser-based. So what that means is, that you just need to log into Chrome or Safari or one of these different browsers, and it taps natively into your uh, mic and camera for you to be able to have the call. So when it comes to technology, all you really need is a computer that has the ability to have a microphone and a camera and an internet, and that's really all you need. Which is most people these days anyway. All right, Peter, so we are now going through the first pandemic of our lifetimes that is impacting us on a daily basis. How has the demand for what you guys do changed? So it's, it's been really interesting. I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that you know, we started building this about two and a half years ago when there was no pandemic. On, we built on a thesis of remote work. That, that's where it kind of all started. Um, obviously, in the last six months, our world has been tipped upside down, shook and around, and then turned right back side up. Um, and so the people who never thought they'd ever look at virtual as a potential option, both clients and providers, which is super interesting. They're now being forced to look at this as a medium and say, how can we provide a quality product or how can I see my provider that I need to see in this new environment that now I have to deal with? Mm -hmm. Very similar to, to getting used to wearing masks, right? It's, 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 we're getting used to how this new way we need to operate is. And, and right now, virtual is one of those pieces. Now, I'm, I'm not... I'm not one of those hardcore people. I understand there's a play, time, place for in person. So I, I'm, I'm not going to say just because we have a, a platform say, oh, yes, you know, virtual is, is everything. It's not. Um, but it's a really critical piece that a lot of people think we're ignoring for a long time. Um, there's a time, place where you're going to need to go and see someone in person. That's a reality. But our virtual is going to lessen the load on, on, our, on our system and our healthcare system so that the in-person stuff can happen a lot more efficiently and safely. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and I also think that the the type of services might have changed. You're in the wellness field. So how has the demand for things like mental health uh, shifted? And also, actually, even on the on the other side, a lot of one-on-one -on -one and gyms are restricting uh, amount of people uh, that can get in. So how has that, that shifted for folks? Yeah, so what, what we're seeing on our platform so far, definitely an increased usage on the mental health therapies. Um, you know, people can you know, easily access someone that they can talk to. That has increased dramatically. But we're seeing a really easy, um, interesting trend towards one-on-one -on -one fitness virtually. Mm. Um, and so you're actually seeing people uh, set up their computers, um, roll out a yoga mat, and, and, and actually be led through a yoga class. Mm. Um, you're seeing people set up their, 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 their iPod for some music and have a personal trainer and lead them through a high-intensity workout. And, and this is stuff that I'm sure if me and you sat down a year ago, we'd say, yeah, maybe a few people would want to do that. But, but people are into it. it. It's filling a gap. You mentioned you worked out with, with your buddy virtually every morning. And like, that's amazing. You never would have done that a year ago, no, right? No. But, but, but now it's becoming the normal thing. Totally. And I, it is funny because the convenience factor is there. Once people learn the repertoire of what they can do and they can do it safely, which I mean, obviously a concern coming from the, the personal training background is making sure people are doing it right. But once you get by some of those simple barriers, which can be mitigated with technology, 
the convenience factor, it allows people to spend half as much time to get the same amount of a workout. And, and you know, so it's funny. My little routine is I wake up at 6 a.m., I do my workout, and then I, uh, I'll i do a couple minutes on a little bike that I got while I catch up on my favorite podcast and make breakfast, and I'm, I'm a half an hour earlier to when I would be working typically. Are, are companies seeing that? Is that why they're migrating towards a platform like yours? I think companies are concerned. You know, what I'm hearing from most companies, the ones that are innovative, uh, the ones that are, are really in tune with their employees, they're realizing the, the impact that this is having on them. And they understand that if their employees are not well, I mean, you know, me and you have been singing this tune for, for, for years, the whole idea of making employees well and, and how it's going to impact the bottom line and, and how it's going to impact the culture within a workplace. But they're really seeing it now because it's, it's, they're, they're being forced to look at it in the face. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're seeing people every day on the video camera and they can just see the drain of, of being, of being isolated and not having those normal outlets. So I, I think companies are now starting to search, at least the ones that really care about their employees they are saying, Hey, listen, we need a solution. And we can't just go out and simply just say, Hey guys, we're all going to pay for your gym memberships now yeah. because that doesn't work for about 50% of their employees now. Mm-hmm. And now hiring practices are changing. So they're saying, I just don't care where you live because it doesn't really matter because we're all going to meet up virtually online anyway. Um, so I'm going to hire people in the U.S., over in Ireland, uh, in Germany, and uh, all over the place. But then how do we offer a comprehensive wellness service offering for people if we're in five different countries? Yeah. Um, like like what one, of, one of our clients is uh, is Shopify, and uh, and that's literally what we're doing. We're servicing some of their employees virtually in Ireland, Germany, down the U.S., across Canada. And, and they have to think very globally when it comes to a strategy. And virtual is really going to be the only comprehensive way that they can do that. Actually, one of the challenges with wellness programs was it was typically a head office program because that's where the majority of people were. And a lot of companies have people spread out here and there, and they get kind of left out of the mix. This sounds like it can kind of level the field for a lot of folks. Also, like what we found with corporate wellness is that, you know, and I think you'd probably agree with me that lots of people don't want to manifest their wellness while they're physically at work, Right. It's very personal, you know, and and, and uh, we have similar backgrounds. So, like, both of us have gone into corporations. We've done consultations, one-on-one with people, and they've kind of st- we, they've set an office aside for us, right, during the day, and we kind of rotated through people coming in, doing the assessments and and things like that. And th- pe- people don't necessarily want to go from a meeting about their corporate accounting to I'm struggling with weight loss or mm. I'm struggling with my mental health, and you know. I, I got kids at home and, 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 and that, that are driving me nuts and I just need to talk to somebody. It's really tough to switch gears, hey, like, and just get mm. there. So the idea of offering outlets for people outside of their work hours as a company is, is just vastly important and, 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 uh, and pivotal to people achieving their wellness. I think that's that's actually a great point. And the other thing is, is that to be able to have an army of different skill sets to be able to walk in and out, depending on who's walking in the room is actually impossible. You've got to find people that are good at a lot of things, but maybe not an expert in others. Meanwhile, if you're scrolling through some sort of online platform, you can find the exact expert that can help you with the problem. And is that been one of the things that's, that's sort of shown up? You hit the nail on the head. I mean, like, you know, again, like we, we've been there, right? You, you bring in, let's say, a, a dietitian for a lunch and learn, which is great. But maybe only 10% of the population are really interested in nutrition. Mm. Um, so what about that other 90%? You know, and so that's why we try to push the bounds of the types of providers that we have. Like we have Podorthis, we have virtual Reiki, virtual meditation. Um, you know, we have virtual physiotherapists. We have the virtual yoga instructors and and we're really starting to push those. We're actually now looking at even expanding to um, virtual music lessons and language uh, instruction and the, the lifestyle aspect of wellness and, and how it impacts people. So like the reality is some of these outlier services do get a ton of bookings on them. Well, no, but there's a couple. And that was really meaningful to the, that one or two people in that workplace that decided to, to book one of those because it was available to them. So our theory is that I think a person should actually have a team of healthcare providers at their fingertips anytime. Yeah, right. 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 Like, yeah. So like just, just the idea of if you could have unlimited access to whatever healthcare providers that you want and, and you say, yeah, I got, sure, I got my physio, I got my personal trainer, I got my dietitian, I got my counselor, I got everything there and I can book with any of them at any time whatever I want. And I I just think it's so free and so powerful. Yeah, that's a a huge shift for people, especially when, you know, again, give it six months ago, people were struggling to get a doctor's visit. I think that's one of the ways that we've been able to pivot as a 
as a community is that all of a sudden, for the first time, health has become more important to people. And they're actually seeing why they understand about comorbidities, they understand about risk factors. They know that, you know, anybody can kind of become susceptible if they're exposed to the pandemic and, and COVID. What are some of the results you're seeing for people? Are, are people taking a more proactive attitude towards their health now? Definitely, definitely. We, um, we don't necessarily like, again, our, our platform is completely encrypted. So we don't necessarily get direct data access to, 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 to how people are using the platform, who's using what. Mm-hmm. However, we do get a lot of secondhand feedback from the companies about how they're taking much more proactive approaches because it's so easy. Everything is about barriers, right? Is it convenient? We live in a world right now where everything is at a touch of a button. And if we need to step outside, no matter how much people will argue and say, yeah, I really need this. Um, if it's not convenient, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so it's it's our job to say, hey, how can we make this so there's no barriers, so it's super convenient? So if someone's feeling something, a, a great example is a muscular injury. So if someone has some sort of injury and they're like, okay, my wrist hurts a little bit. They're mm-hmm. like, well, it's not that bad. I'm not going to interrupt my day, book an appointment in the middle of the day, go all the way down to the physio, do the appointment, come back. So they're going to wait till it's so bad that it's chronic, mm-hmm. and then they need to have a whole ton of therapy. But if you make it so easy to ask that one question, like, hey, listen, your work setup, your workspace setup is messed up, and that's the reason why you're feeling this, you need to change it now or else it can get really, really bad. Then you don't need all that therapy because you had the right, right advice at the right time. Right. Yeah, exactly. You're preemptively doing something. It's like you're fixing the roof when there's a leak, not before the roof caves in on you. So, Peter, we're starting to wind down here, but what do you think is next for the online wellness world? You know, that, that's a really interesting question, Mike. I, I I, I think virtual is here to stay, even, even once we get back to, I'm going to use the term normal, but w- whatever that is. I think how we look at work, how we look at wellness, it's all fundamentally changed um, and, and is not going back. As I mentioned earlier, do I think it's going to be 100% virtual? No, it's not. There's going to be a mixture. It's going to be a hybrid. But what we've done is we've introduced a new tool. We've introduced a new modality that now is going to be ubiquitous for people when they think about wellness. It's going to be, okay, so I need help. It's not going to be like, oh, I guess I got to make an appointment and go in as a default. It's going to be like, what is, the, what is the best way for me based on how I'm feeling of how I should see someone? You know, And so that's why for us going through corporations, um, it allows us to reach a maximum of people. Like general pop- population can go to our website and just buy services too. Um, uh, right now our main focus is on the corporation side, but that's available as well. And I think that's how people are going to start thinking about it. Um, it's going to be like, who do I need to see? When do I need to see them? And in what way, what modality do I need to see them in? Right. That's access. That's a company giving somebody the tools at their fingertips is something they may not have on their own because of various reasons. So that sounds like it's uh, yeah, it may actually make a difference, not only in how we do things, but also what the outcomes are. Well, thanks so much for taking the time today, Peter. I know you're super busy these days. You guys are, you guys are growing pretty rapidly, but uh, I appreciate you taking the time and, and letting listeners know what uh, what's out there in the new world of wellness. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. The world of fitness has traditionally involved going to gyms and classes in person, but with a greater percentage of people working from home and the forced lockdowns at the beginning of the pandemic, more and more people are migrating to and seeing the benefits of working out at home. Our next guest is Jill Whalen from Whalen Wellness. She has seen a huge growth in her online wellness business, which allows her to connect with her clients and take a holistic approach and community feel to improving their health. And this is really resonating with people. She joined me from her home fitness studio to tell me more about what's happening with online fitness. Welcome to the show, Jill. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, you have been all over the news lately with uh, with your business. You have really exploded for your wellness company during the pandemic. For those people that may have not heard of you, can you give a bit of a background on, on where you came from and what's going on now? Absolutely. I've been around, so I've, sh- I've shifted things recently. So that's probably why you're hearing a lot recently about me. But I've been around in this industry locally for almost 12 years. Um, I started coaching fitness a few years after I finished my business degree. After I finished my, my Bachelor of Commerce at MUN, I went on to train with some of the leading experts in fitness, nutrition, mindset coaching all around the world. So that's how I gained my education there. And then I came back here to Newfoundland and did my training with a few different coaches around here locally, worked at a few gyms, ran my own gym for five years. And then uh, things shifted for me in 2017. 
I actually took a full break. I kind of disappeared from the industry after I decided it was my decision to close my gym. And I did so because I kind of wanted um, what I, the work I was doing, although I knew it was good, I knew it was high quality work. It wasn't uh, feeding my soul the way it had previously. So I decided to kind of disappear for a little while and work on me, my internal and my external self, and then bring back my best self to the industry. So what I offer now is a comprehensive wellness approach, not just fitness coaching. I know I can put anybody through a great workout, but I want people to feel great inside and out because that's the most important thing. Mm, and I think that's even more relevant these days where people are experiencing stress, but also, you know, physical, emotional, mental, uh, a lot of uncertainty. So that, that makes sense to be balanced. Absolutely. So you got into the field by studying uh, in different places, but who are the type of clients that you would deal with typically? Who migrates to you? I actually, I have such a wide demographic, Mike, it's crazy because we have all ages, all shapes, all sizes, all experiences. So I have the basic new brand new exerciser with me right now, but I also have a lot of local trainers that are doing my program as well and getting mm -hmm. the benefits from it. It's very, the way I approach things and the way I teach things right now is completely scalable at all levels. Right. And so, so one thing we didn't really talk about there, when you reemerged, now you've really evolved into the majority of your work being online. Tell me a bit about that. Yes. And that was part of, so I had, I first put pen to paper for this program in late 2017 after I had closed my gym. But what was, there was a couple of things holding me back from bringing it to the market. One was um, a little bit of guts, a little bit of courage. And then the other thing was figuring out the most appropriate vehicle because I was on a mission to smash any perceived barriers to people's fitness and wellness. And things like cost, things like scheduling, which is a, hu a huge one, things like discomfort and vulnerability, all of those things I wanted to smash. So once COVID hit and we were isolated, um, it gave me the opportunity to have time to sit down and finalize the content and, and figure out the vehicle to deliver this on. So it's all virtual. It's all done. I, I have a studio in my home where I film from and we stream the classes via Zoom. And then the rest of the platform is through a Facebook group right now. And we do all of our discussion, discussions and mindset coaching and that kind of stuff inside the Facebook group. Wow, that's great. And, and I, uh, the social determinants of health are actually, they represent 50% of the results people get, whether they've got Absolutely. access or whether they're, they're, a, they're a vulnerable population or things like that. That's, mm -hmm. that's one of the things I think is the appeal. Like, What are some of the barriers you've seen being removed by being in an online environment? There's so many that um, that even even you and I who are sensitive to this because we've worked in this industry for so long, there's things that we probably still wouldn't think of. Things like they're afraid for people to see them sweat. They feel uncomfortable or they feel vulnerable in that position. Then there's high profile clients who really don't want to be in the public eye training and exercising and learning and feeling uncomfortable. And then there's also things like scheduling and children and all those. There's just so many barriers out there that we may not think of when we're trying mm -hmm. to, you know, when you're trying to schedule around a few hours in a gym. Well, I, I think, you know, even on the guy side of things, the guys think they got to be tough sometimes. So we've got to lift as much or keep up. And, and some business models are based on that competitiveness that's on a screen and things like that. But sometimes it's nice, probably when you're not on camera, where you can just take a little breather, no one sees it, and you can go at your own pace. I feel Absolutely. like that would be one of the biggest appeals. I, I do some online workouts with my, my workout partner, and I cheat all the time. <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's okay, because I'm going to go as hard as I feel like it, you know? But well, that's the thing. You go hard um, when you're okay to go hard. Sometimes when our ego takes over when we're public and we go hard when we shouldn't, when it's not safe or smart that particular day, which can be ever changing as well. So when I do the beginning of each round of my program, I do an orientation session and I talk about that. And I talk about how all of us, no matter if we've been training for years, like I have for decades, um, we can still learn and grow. So we have to be open and coachable and vulnerable to that. And in this space, it's comfortable to grow that way. Right. And so let's keep on digging into that the balanced approach you're talking about. So you're talking about people working at their own level. So is there for this approach, do you give people a sort of a baseline of where they are or what their challenges are and what they need to work on? Like, how does that philosophy play out? Yes. So my, we do three classes together a week for the fitness portion of it. My, first of all, my system is based on a four pillar system that I've designed. One of those pillars is movement. The part of the movement piece involves three classes with me a week. Two of them are strength focused, but it's very easily doable. And in fact, we launched this right in the depths of quarantine. 
So we people were using, instead of dumbbells, people were using soup cans or mm -hmm. jugs of kitty litter or whatever they had at home. And they can make it work that way because there are so many ranges. Now, a lot of my clients that have been with me from the beginning have since added to their home spaces and have dumbbells and whatnot. So I always recommend if you have a yoga mat and some light dumbbells, you're good to get started. And everybody, then the experienced exercisers, they kind of know what they need to get started and get challenged as well. So I talk to them all on entry and we decide where you're at. Sometimes it's body weight only to make sure that the patterns are learned correctly and then we build from there right and then when it comes to the other side of things what are you doing when it comes to eating behaviors or uh the mental health side of things so that is also one of the other pillars is nutrition and that is the beast of the industry oftentimes i find it's where people struggle the most and it's where a lot of um food anxieties and stresses and, and uncomfortable relationships are born and having gone through a lot of that personally myself, I think I can really relate to people. So what I have embraced personally and what I now teach is the mindfulness-based eating approach. So we talk about mindful eating versus I will never subscri subscribe or prescribe a meal plan to my mm -hmm. clients. Mm -hmm. We are not, we talk about that in orientation too. None of us in this space are competing at next year's Olympics and none of us are stepping on stage as bodybuilders in the next couple months. So. I don't feel that there's great use for that within my program. So we talk about mindful eating and building a healthy, enjoyable relationship with food. Okay, so just give a background on what mindful eating really means for folks. It's connected to the basic concept of mindfulness, where you are very aware and in the moment of your environment, um, what you are doing, your actions, and things that trigger you. So that's what we start learning in the nutrition aspect and kind of understand, okay, am I hungry? Yes. What would I like to eat and why do I want to eat that? And then am I still hungry? Yes. And I'm working on portions and working on different things that make us feel good. So my general concept that I teach people right from the beginning is that we will eat to feel. We will eat according to how we want to feel after we've consumed that food. Mm, that's a great point. Uh, what, are, what are the other yeah. two pillars? Uh, hydration. Mm -hmm. So we talk about hydrating because you can read, and I, I'm sure, Mike, of course, you have read all of this, but the general public, you can read anywhere that it is proven that North Americans are chronically dehydrated. So it's very important that we get that hydration in. So we talk about a baseline approach, and then we talk about how we can grow in different ways to make sure that we're always hydrated because it helps your brain work a little better too, helps with dig digestion, helps with energy, as you know, all of these things. Oh, so, yeah. so that's movement nutrition hydration and then the last pillar is mindset so we do a minimum of two mindset coaching sessions a week they are live coaching sessions in which i deliver content but it's ever-changing content it's based on what's going on within this community within my group and things we've discussed or things that we've some hurdles we've experienced or things like that and then we'll talk around we'll peel back the layers and we'll dig deep into some issues i take questions and we have great discussions usually about an hour an hour and a half a couple of times a week we're talking online fitness with Jill Whalen from Whalen Wellness. We'll be right back after this break. I think one of the one of the things is as opposed to a gym owner, because we both own gyms, we know what it was like. There's only yeah. a certain amount of people you can fit in, in particular when there's new restrictions on physical distancing. How many people are you able to reach with a platform like this? I, I I won't say everybody, yeah. <laughs> of course, but the numbers can be quite high. I mean, it's been growing since I started, since I launched this in May, and we are managing just fine. We're still able to connect on a personal level with everybody that we have here. And, and I explain this type of work for me personally is a passion project. I love this. And I think this is the reason I believe this is the reason why I've never been fully satisfied until now, because mm -hmm. if I had clients before this, I would have them in a gym, for example, probably three hours a week within those three hours a week, I need to deliver them some pretty great workouts. There's not a lot of time for the rest of it. There's not a lot of time for the technical teaching, the nutrition talks, the, the motivation and the mindset work. It's just the time just isn't here. But on a platform like this, I have them 24 hours a day. It's wonderful. I love and, it. And then they have a community outside of just having one person that they're relying on for everything. They've got each other probably as well. That's one of the biggest parts of the success of this program is the community we've built together. It's the people. They are so wonderful and supportive. I feel like people are dying for a bit of a community right now because we are being more cautious of where we're going and how big, large groups of people uh, to be able to have something that's around health that does give that would be very appealing to a lot of folks. I think that's probably why we see Pelotons and those group classes doing so well as well. 
You know? Yeah, for sure. We're all craving that connection a little extra this year. So um, what's been the feedback from people so far, especially I'm sure you've got a lot of people that have been hardcore gym people their whole lives. Uh, what are people saying about this way of exercising and, and it, actually living? Mm-hmm. It's really exciting when I receive the client experiences or testimonials, because as I explained, the client base is so broad and everybody comes from such different experiences and backgrounds. And when they share their stories with me and how this is enhancing their life, it's so exciting. So I have people that are former competitive bodybuilders who are rebuilding um, their nutrition relationships. Then I have people who are um, moms who have put themselves on the back burner for a very long time and are now seeing their value and their worth and what they're capable of. Then I have people like men who work offshore and are, or work away on rotation work. And they're able to do this when they're home in quarantine or when they're working away. And there's just, there's so many different experiences and why it fits into those particular people's lives. Mm. Okay. So we've talked about some feedback. What are some of the results people are getting? I can tell you for one, since I started doing my Skype workouts, my workout partner, We've never missed the gym. There's no nope. rolling over and being late and being like, oh, I'm going to be half an hour late. I'm not going to make it. So I actually feel ironically that I've, uh, I'm have i getting in better shape than I've been in years and years and years. What are some of the results folks are seeing? I love that you're saying that because I'm having a similar experience. I have <laughs> never been so consistent. Me neither. I've never yeah. been so consistent in my life. And that's what my clients are saying too. They're saying I'm finally able to carve out that time because the commute is nothing. I have our live classes start at 5 40 a.m. and I have clients say that they set their alarm for 5 38 mm, <laughs> and arrive for the warm-up in their living room Perfect. so it's great and then I look forward to as much as I, I don't look forward to snow days I look forward to not having to cancel my classes for a snow day for example mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then we have clients all across the world in several different countries so the time zones don't matter that you know the schedule don't matter your work life doesn't matter there's always that 45 or 50 minutes that you can pick wherever works for you well the other thing about digital workout is that you record them and people are able to access them afterwards correct yeah 24 7 and actually they remain available so for as long as you have a membership you have access to the entire database so Mm -hmm. if there's a day that you it's really yucky outside and you don't want to go for your hike on the in-between days then you can pick up another class that we did previous I'm a huge advocate on health literacy and especially like people exercising properly. Um, How do you ensure that people are doing things correctly? I'm big on technical form. So I take a bit of time at the beginning of each workout to go through the specific exercises that we'll be doing. But then I offer ongoing exercise demo sessions as well. Mm -hmm. So we will take an hour or two here and there and I'll, I'll put up, I'll ask for whatever they need help with. I'll compile a list and then we'll go right through and then they can study and practice from that. And That's then great. we'll rework those exercises again, just to ensure that no unsafe patterns are developed. Right. You talked before about, you know, sort of having to find a purpose. And I think, you know, people choose this field a lot of the time because they do want to help people and they kind of need to have that fulfillment. Why do you think this has been so much more fulfilling for you than because than, you've been in lots of different aspects of the industry? Yeah, I have. And I think it's because I really did a lot of soul searching a few years ago, as I mentioned, and really figured out my own kind of demons and my own issues around food and that kind of stuff, got to the bottom of it and healed that stuff myself. So I have been there and I'm quite open and raw and vulnerable when it comes to the coaching sessions that I offer in talking about my experiences and in talking the steps that I took to get to where I am today, who have very well-balanced happy full life and I want I want that for people too I want um I want negative body image to end I want restrictive eating and restrictive binge cycles to end I want that for these people so badly so when I hear from them in their experiences when they send me notes saying I had such a breakthrough today in xyz that's how I measure my success it's amazing when you can have people have those breakthroughs So if you were to give people a little bit of advice for each one of your four pillars, like as the sort of key thing that they should know, what would you tell them about each one of your pillars? For nutrition, it's mostly on learning things that we've learned along the way and developing a healthy relationship. That's where it all starts. For the hydration, it's about getting the water in your body so that everything functions a little better. So minimum about 50% of your body weight in ounces is what I recommend. Um, Mindset, it's a work in progress every single day. It's like showering. You don't just 
talk about your mindset once and it's good to go forever. That's something that we should always be open and vulnerable in that space. And movement, I recommend that you move your body every day. I do not recommend that you do crazy intense exercise every day, but I recommend that you move your body every day because your brain is linked to your body and your body is linked to your brain. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people run into roadblocks. It's funny. I was horrible at hydrating for years. Horrible. I got a soda stream. Absolute worst. I was the worst. It was my news resolution every year forever. Uh, But then I got, I I got a soda stream afterwards and I was like, this is doing it. And I'm fine. I was able to hack that one. But I think that's what people sometimes struggle with is how do you, um, how do you get by those, uh, those roadblocks, you know? And, and I think that's where having some support is really valuable because we are way more on our own than we used to be. So I guess that would be the thing I'd ask at the end, like, why should somebody turn to a coach for this? Because because I think we could all use a little bit of help in this space. It's there's so much out there and there's so much conflicting information out there that I think if we shift gears, because I know when I changed my approach from um, seeing a certain number on the scale or seeing a certain size in my clothing, when I shifted all that to feeling good, and facing my day every day, feeling energetic and strong and a real a real lust for life, then the game changed. And so I want people to start striving for overall wellness because the body transformation stuff will come. If you get your inside aligned, then your outside will align right along with it eventually. Hmm. Well, our philosophies are very much in line on that. And that's the point of today's show um, yeah. is to get advice for people to hear from experts that that is really what the point of health is. It's caring for yourself and, and trying to do the best you can with what you got. What's next for you, you know, as you continue to evolve your your business? There's a bunch of exciting stuff on the cusp right now. But for now, I'm like I said, this is a passion project. I love what I'm doing. Um, the biggest change I see here coming with virtual bootcamp is just moving off to uh, our very own platform, probably outside of Facebook into our own site where we will keep the database and everything else. Outside of that, we're about to launch our merch store and I'm beginning to be approached for seeking engagements. And that's something I love as well. So that's I want to build on all those things. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your very, very busy schedule to have a chat with us today. I know everybody appreciates hearing from a real expert. So thanks. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you to both of my guests today for sharing their experiences in the world of online wellness and fitness. It's undoubtedly one of the most challenging times for those in the fitness industry, but this shows that there's still a huge opportunity for those people that are creative in helping others, in particular when it comes to health, because that is a critical part of the shift that is occurring in so many aspects of our lives. Join me next week as we talk to Ben Prentice, who is largely regarded as the world's leading strength coach for hockey players. He's trained NHL All-Stars like Marty St. Louis and players from 29 of the 30 NHL hockey teams. He's also the strength consultant for the New York Rangers. With sport performance and conditioning becoming more mainstream, Ben will walk us through some of the do's and don'ts for young athletes and parents. He'll also explain what an off-season looks like for the professional athletes that work out at his Connecticut facility. It's extremely interesting and a great listen. Well, thanks for joining me today. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall, and we'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Health and Wellness Show on your VOCM.